Kids learning, classrooms, homes, they are all places where interacting we're with kids and we have the privilege to work with them. And this means that we're able to leave some fingerprints on their future learning habits. Today, we are chatting with executive function coach, Carrie Vonnet, and she is back for another conversation on this oh so important topic. I'm really excited for all of us to continue learning about this. So welcome, Carrie. Thanks for being here. Hello, Melissa. Thank you. I love talking about this stuff. So anytime. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, can we, let's recap because some people may be like, I thought we were just helping kids stay focused. What are executive functions? So let's do a little bit of a recap. Sure. Tell us a little bit about yourself um, as well as kind of a basic uh, definition of executive functions. Okay. Uh, definitely focus is part of it. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> um, so, right. I'm Carrie. I am an executive function coach based in Bend, Oregon. Um, I come to this work from the teacher side. So I was a classroom teacher for 14 years. I taught middle and high school, all kinds of humanities classes. Um, and I've been doing this coaching work for almost four years now. Um, I, I, I came across this thing called executive function, not in my teacher training, which I'm sure there are people going to be nodding along, right? Like I'm almost 50. <laughs> so I I'm old, but I haven't, I didn't hear about this thing called executive function until the last, I don't know, five or six years or so. Um, and so, but when I, when I first was introduced to it, there was a bit of an aha moment, like, Oh, that's what that means. And I couldn't, unsee it anymore. So what executive function is sort of the, the brief definition that I like to give is they are the brain skills that help us get our stuff done. So great. You yeah. know, you mentioned staying focused, which yes, there are, there are all these skills. I like to use a list of about 11 different skills. Mm -hmm. Um, one of which is called sustained attention, which basically just means focus, <laughs> maintaining yeah. focus. Um, but we're talking about, yes, we're talking about focus. Um, another skill is time management. Another mm -hmm. different skill is organization. There's also, um, self-monitoring, right? Like that seems, uh, important in any classroom, but especially a homeschool classroom, like can this child kind of monitor his or her own progress and their progress. And, and so self-monitoring is like being aware of, of what's going on in your brain and in your world. Um, and so we're talking about all these getting started. That's another huge one task initiation. So mm -hmm. you see where I'm headed with this stuff, right? Like it's, the, there are many skills. Unfortunately, they are all connected. <laughs> like <laughs> you can't like, you have to finish a task, but you have to have to start it and stay focused mm -hmm. in order to finish. So they're all interconnected, but there's lots going on. It's way more than do your work. Yeah. You know, like just sit down and do your work. I, you know that, but, yeah. um, but that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. I love it. Now in, in that definition, you, had, you mentioned a lot of things. Now for those of you who aren't listening, let's just play a little game real quick. Okay. So if you've got something nearby, um, or if you just want to like mental note these, I'm going to read off a few more. Okay. Um, and these, I just want you to identify which ones stand out to you. For me, when I listen to these, I'm like, Oh, my oldest struggles with this. My youngest struggles with this. My middle struggle with this. Right. So you're going to hear some of these and go, Oop. Okay, so here are some of these areas, okay? Manage time and attention, set goals, plan and organize, switch focus, adjust and refocus, attend to details, develop timelines, complete tasks efficiently, manage stress and anxiety, collaborate effectively, maintain clutter-free space, control and regulate behavior. All right. So these are all kind of these magic tasks that make up executive functions. And Carrie, some of those areas stick out more to me um, mm -hmm. because of my experience homeschooling my kids and as a classroom teacher. But um, some of those are adjusting and refocusing, man managing time and attention and completing tasks efficiently. And I know you've been working with a lot of teachers as well as families kind of one-on-one -on -one in these situations. You also work with adults too, which um, I know I've learned a lot. And I think about you often, Carrie, when I'm like, how to get this done? Um, I think, oh, what would Carrie say? What would Carrie do? Um, and so you've worked with a lot of teachers across a lot of different areas and ages. So tell us a few stories about how executive function work has helped kiddos, adults, families manage their areas better. Could be classrooms or homes or just their general uh, functioning. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, a couple of things come to mind. One is that I love to do um, 
like teacher trainings for like large groups. So, so I've done a handful of those. And what I, what I have heard from, from teachers is, oh, <laughs> um, you know, like you're saying, which ones stand out to you? And, and what, like I was saying, you know, it's, it's more than just sit down and do your work. Um, and so what I hear from teachers a lot is, is just the recognition that there's more to it than they thought. Right. Like I, I, I'm picturing a high school teacher who I worked with last summer uh, um, in the uh, staff training. And his comment was exactly that. Like, so you're telling me that when I give a whole class period or it was high school, so maybe an entire week in class mm -hmm. to, to work on their project and the student just kind of sits there and spins their wheels or can't get started or what you're you're telling me that that that's an executive function issue. And I say, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like I was saying, you can't unsee it, right? Like, so now that teacher in particular, when hopefully when he sees the student in his class spinning their wheels and can't get started, too distracted by the other kids in the class, um, maybe needs a quiet space, maybe needs headphones, maybe need, like starts to, to get curious rather than judgmental. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, like, I love stories like that because I could see yeah. the wheels turning in his head like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, right? Like, yeah. not, and I don't believe that students are willful when they are struggling with this stuff, right? Like, I don't, it's not a character flaw. It is not willful. I really do believe students would do better if they could. Um, and so I love hearing stories about that. So that's one yeah. just super simple example of this, this one teacher that I worked yeah. with. Um, and then right now I'm working with, I'm piloting a teacher coaching group. So just, there's like a small group of us that get together um, on Zoom once a month, but there's sort of chatting and content and sharing on Marco Polo and things like that um, during the week. And those four teachers that are in that real small group right now, there's just a lot of conversations about like, okay, but what's, what's something I can try? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Be some, Cause I know you and I've talked before about some sort of general, um, ideas, one of which is what I call making the invisible visible, mm -hmm. right? Like keeping things in your face, in your student's face, if we want them to remember, because otherwise stuff is invisible, like it just disappears into the ether. <laughs> um, yeah. But some of the things that have been coming up with those, those teachers is um, we've been, we've been doing, I've been encouraged that in encouraging those teachers to do with students, what I call a distraction inventory. <laughs> Ooh. It's basically like having a real conversation either with a whole class or a small group like in a home school or just with like one student who's really struggling like let's have a just brief conversation about can you recognize what are the biggest distractions yeah. right like literally is it people sitting next to you humans other humans is it your own thoughts? I have students tell me that all the time, like in their own head is so distracting. There's stuff going on in there all the time. Um, is it a, a pet perhaps if in a homeschool or in a, yeah. you know, do your homework, right? Like they're just so cute. So they yeah. <laughs> get a, trying to have a conversation about yeah. that and then setting up the workspace very intentionally um, to reduce if possible, remove, if possible, some of those yeah. distractions. It's not always easy. I will tell you too, that um, students can't always answer. So one of the, yeah. one of the students or one of the teachers I was working with said she was real excited about this and had a conversation with one of her third graders. And he was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the distractions are. I really don't. Yeah. Um, but even in that case, I feel like it's not, it's not wasted time to no. start having these conversations. Yeah. And, you know, even as, at that younger age, you know, talking third grade, my second grader um, mm -hmm. today, just today, he was supposed to be doing a writing thing, loves the writing thing, very excited about the writing thing, but he could not focus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I caught myself saying, hey, just sit down and get it done. Let's mm -hmm. get it done. And he said, but yeah. so distracting. He used those words. Yeah. And I was like, okay, where is it not distracting? He goes, well, the couch, my sister's over there. And then my other sister's over here. And the little sister is upstairs and she's playing with something and I can hear her. Mm -hmm. And where can I go? And I said, well, we've got one other chair in this kind of stairwell area. And yeah, it's not the most comfortable. He goes, it's okay. I'll make it comfortable. 
I'm so excited to have that other option presented to him. So sometimes it's the unorthodox. And if we're at home, maybe we can do that. But as a classroom teacher, I know that I did that too. You have to get creative. Maybe you're moving desks somewhere. Maybe you're changing seating charts. Maybe you're um, bringing out some of those extra tools like um, earphones. what will we call those headphones, Ear- like, earphones, yeah. earmuffs? Yeah, um, to to take away those distractions. And it's not a privilege. It's not a a, a benefit. Mm-hmm. It's it's an equalizer. It's it's helping yes, people that. focus. So, well, you um, know, I feel the same way about that, right? Like that accommodations yeah. are are not are important, yeah. right? Like it's just to. E- I love how you say that. It's just an equalizer. Yeah. Um, yeah, all that stuff is super important. I mean, just, and he sounds like he was able to identify, maybe he couldn't in the moment, you had to kind of coax it out of him with some questioning, oh, yeah. but like maybe in the moment he couldn't, but he, he recognized that, oh, if I sit there, maybe that will be less distracting, um, which is great. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Right? And, and I would have given them these tools. Yes. It's exactly. really important. Tool of strategies. Like, and I would encourage um, reflection on that also. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but like, hey. Remember earlier today when you were really struggling, your brain sure was distracted, wasn't it? And we discovered a place where, you know, just having that conversation with him could be so good. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. So as we're in a classroom, if we're in, ho- at our, in our homes or if we're in a lecture hall, you know, mm-hmm. we're, we're trying to figure out ways that we can implement some of these strategies like tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've talked about some of these conversations that we can have some mm-hmm. of perhaps the inventories that we can take. Mm-hmm. I love that distraction inventory. Yeah. Um, I think that's really cool. Um, anything else you can give us there in terms of kind of tick, ticking the boxes? Um, we've talked about making the invisible visible. Um, I have taken full advantage of that. We've got to-do mm-hmm. lists in front of kids. Um, they are, they're, they're progressing in that, in that way. Yeah. What else would you add there? Um, let's, I want to come to the to-do list for just a minute, if that's okay. So I love a list. I love a checklist. It's brains like checklists if it's achievable. So the thing that I like to teach teachers, um, parents, kids about this thing in our brain called dopamine, (laughs) where, um, you know this probably, but you know that when we kind of cross off something off of a list or check a box or, or finish a task like that, we earn a little bit of dopamine for our brains. Um, but the reason for that is that we, we can only earn the dopamine for our brain, which is the feel good chemical. Um, if the, if, if the brain, the, the thing was achievable, right? So I teach kids how to kind of trick their brains and teachers can do this too, can trick, teach kids how to trick their brains. Um, what the neuroscience says is there's two different parts of our brains that, that create or, um, emit, that's not the right word, but um, dopamine, release, and yeah. release dopamine. Um, and in this one sort of in the central part of our brain, the way they've kind of figured out that there's like three steps to that we can recreate. So it's super simple, but it's related to the to-do list. So one yeah. step one is that we set a goal, right? Like we write something on a to-do list, but step two is that our brain has to think we can do it. Mm-hmm. So it has to be achievable. It has to be attainable. And then the third step is then there has to be proof that we met our goal. That's the checkbox, right? Yeah. <laughs> or the crumpling yeah. up of the paper. Um, yeah. Or like in video games, kids mm-hmm. who play video games can buy into this because they know that this happens. Video game designers know this about brains. We set a goal. I want to like level up. Yeah. Win the game, whatever. Um my brain thinks I can do it because I'm really good at this game. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And it may not be today, but like I'm getting gaining some games, you know, you have to gain momentum, but then usually on the screen, there's something visual or, or audible, like some Mm -hmm. music, some special music or some confetti or whatever. Some level complete. Uh Level complete. Oh, I know that. I mean, workout complete. All of this. Yeah. And your brain goes, look at me. I thought I could, and I did, and here's the proof. Um, mm-hmm. But we can use that, right? And we, and with a to-do list is a perfect example, like a checklist or a to-do list. Because if we have 25 things on a to-do list, our brain does not think we can do 25 things, right? Like, so yeah. baby steps, small, small, small chunks, even teachers and homeschool teachers, like one thing at a time. So sometimes I even with students will make, one, a, a checklist with one thing on one it. One item. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. 
Because yeah. for lots of reasons, but especially this like earn a little dopamine it has to be achievable. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's also one of the skills we haven't talked about is working memory. Okay. So like kind of remembering what we're doing as we're doing it, or, you know, I need to get milk from the grocery store. Um, but that one thing on a sticky note, mine has a lot on it today. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that one thing on a sticky note is also helping the brain go, oh, that's right. This is what I'm doing right now. So mm -hmm. in a classroom, you know, put a sticky note on the desk, keeping it in sight, but also achievable so that then they can cross it off or crumple it up. Um, I love, I love, I love this idea of just teaching kids about their brains, dopamine yeah. in their brains. That's huge. And even, the, even then, I mean, you can tailor this in so many ways. I mean, we've talked mm -hmm. about young kids. We're thinking about, I've got, you know, a sixth grader now. Um, we're talking about older kids as well. Um, I love Google Keep. I don't know if you've ever used Google Keep. Yeah. Um, for those of you watching, listening, just switch over real quick. Then you come right back, okay? <laughs> switch over to your uh, Gmail that you've probably got open in another tab. And on the right side, there's a little yellow light bulb. Click that. That's Google Keep. And you can create these one item checklists on there. I have about 20, which I'm learning is probably too much. I have some opinions about that. <laughs> but but you're but you've already kind of blown one of my uh, fuses there because one of them is massive. It's yeah. all of these things I have to do. And I might chunk it a little bit more. Um and so I love making them. Uh, what you're talking about, I think I love what, what I call a brain dump. You probably know yeah. this term. Like yeah. just get it, like offload it. Mm -hmm. Huge list. Fine. With a student, for instance, who has a whole bunch of missing assignments, if you're teaching in the classroom, right? I work with a lot of students like that. They just are way, way behind. So sure, dump it, dump it, put them all. Sometimes a piece of paper actually needs to be now Google Keep is great, but yeah. dump it. And then for the one thing or two things that you're going to do right now, make it really, really small. Yeah, I love that. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, lots of tools out there, lots of ways to make it fun. You can add fun backgrounds on Keep. You can use different colored Post-its. So, yeah. um, you know, make this a personal thing. I think that's another um, thing that I've learned about my kids is some of them love the pretty paper. Some of them could care less. Yeah. Um, and some of them just want it to be present um, and others prefer it to be digital. So yeah. there's a lot that we can do here, um, but making it something that is going to get that dopamine um, kick is really, really yeah. Okay. No, I yeah. love this. Now we've talked about all different ages. Talk to me about why this is not something that is just for middle and high schoolers. Cause a lot of people might think, Oh, those missing assignments, get ready for college, be self-sufficient. Why should we start earlier rather than later? Um, I am so glad you brought this up. I, anytime anyone asks me a question about like, when is a good time to start? teaching students about this stuff, I say today, <laughs> because it doesn't matter whether you're a senior in high school or, you know, 20 years old and in college or have younger kids. The, the research actually is pretty clear that the earlier, the better. Um, and that these are skills that need to be taught. They must be taught, um, explicitly taught, sometimes um, observed, right? Like, so for a, a teacher um, or a parent, who for this is an area of strength for them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes their own systems, their students watching them use their own systems, creating their own systems, um, observing that can be helpful. But mm -hmm. the earlier, the better in terms of teaching strategies, um, because by the time they get to middle and high school, that's when I see them. And there's a lot of anxiety and stress around it. Yeah. So I would say maybe that's the reason or just to create um a consistency, right? Like brains really like structure and consistency and routine. Even if the humans don't always like routines and construct and consistency, I work hey, with that's a good point because some might say, throw their hands up and say, oh, I'm just one of those uh those seated oh, by pants people. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's fine. I mean it's what it's what you prefer, right? Mm -hmm. And brains really need structure and they yeah. they um, because otherwise everything is new all the time. And mm -hmm. so the, there's a lot of energy from the prefrontal cortex. That's where executive function hangs out S too much energy to, to navigate all the novelty. And then it, it becomes <gasps> too much 
And then a yeah. student kind of can panic and, and get overwhelmed yeah. pretty easily. So even if compounded that yeah. anxiety in there and for the teachers watching and hopefully the parents, you've recognized that that safety, okay. that um, all basic needs met, need, need to be met before yes. any real learning happens. And so if we're uncomfortable, if we're distracted, if we're anxious, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what double digit multiplication problem you're teaching them. They're not going to get it because that okay. basic um, need isn't met. So this is foundational um, um, and it's really important. Now let's go back to the kit littles one more time okay. um, because a lot of this um, we're talking about to-do lists. We're talking about structures. Um, let, what are some of the ways that you modify this for mm -hmm. the younger crowd? I'm thinking pre-literacy, um, perhaps uh, even, even younger with the yeah. toddlers. What are some of the ways that we can really teach this and model this well? Um, the first thing that comes to mind, because you were talking about um, pre-literacy is, is a checklist with pictures or photos, um, or, and, um, sometimes I don't want to say sometimes older kids need this too, but sometimes older kids need this too. Um, because one of the things that with brains that are challenged in this area, um, sometimes students can't picture themselves either doing the task or how their room is supposed to look when it's clean um, how, what they need to take with them when they walk out the door. So even with older kids, I will say, we'll snap a photo of a kid with their backpack and their water bottle and holding their iPad or whatever it is to refer yeah. to. So photos, pictures are great too, drawn sketches or cartoons or whatever are great too, but even better is a photo of the child doing the thing. Um, so that's one thing that's, that's super easy. Um, you know, another thing that comes to mind with the tiny ones is just, um, time, right? Like time, a lot of students that I work with um, are challenged in this area of time management, time awareness. Um, and so I know a lot of you guys are doing this, but using timers so mm -hmm. that, so that a student, even when they're tiny, a little child, even when they're tiny under starts to understand what five minutes feels like. Um, I am so guilty of not doing this sometimes at the playground or like we're leaving in five minutes. Sure. And then chatting with my friends and then it's 15 minutes later. But like yeah. that, that's a super, super simple um, yeah. thing to 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 introduce if you're not doing it already is using timers so that time is time. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, teaching telling time on an analog clock. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's something that sometimes people think I'm crazy, but it is something that is way more supportive of brains, especially brains that struggle with this stuff than a digital clock. It just gives such a, a, a more complete picture of time. So if maybe not three-year-olds are learning how to do this, but young, young kids, please, please don't well, stop teaching time. An anecdote, anecdote, four-year-old comes up and I'm in the middle of a jump rope workout. Okay. I'm challenging myself. I'm near the end of my, you know, 12 minute jump rope workout. Four-year-old comes up and says, Hey, when are you going to come down and make breakfast? And I say, I've got two minutes. She goes, Oh, when the timer turns red, and I said, yeah, so I've got my phone up there with the analog clock ticking yep. down, you know, giving it, uh, giving it its little uh, spit of the clock. Yeah. And so she knows already, hey, that red means we're getting close to the end. It's that little fraction, mm -hmm. that little um, slice of the pie yeah. and mom's going to come downstairs. And so yeah. it's able to give her there. And and then she stays and she cheers for me, which is also oh, kind of a fun bonus. Oh, I love it. <laughs> It's that sort of thing where giving them the tools. And again, just to put the rubber on the road here, you guys, there are fun timers on YouTube. Oh Google timer yeah. for five minute timer. Yeah. It will um, say up in the tab and they'll be able to watch it. Um, your phone is a great one, although you might walk away with it. And so that's not always going to work. But having yeah. these tools on hand or teaching them how to quickly get to them, making a bookmark on their uh, browser or on their home screen on Google. You know, there's so many little things that we can do to make this a really accessible and quick thing for them. So it doesn't have to be hard and it doesn't have to be complicated. Just yes. go with what you've got and don't be afraid to tweak it. So yes, yes. Huge. I'm so glad you said that too, because not every tool is going to work for every kid and every brain. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I like to call it strategy shopping. <laughs> we yeah. you know, take a little shop around and see which ones are going to be the one that, that helps you the best. Um, I was Absolutely. just going to look up one. Oh, here's one that, a um, one of the teachers in my group just told me about. It's called classroom screen. Is that right? Classroom screen. I think that's what it is. Classroom screen. Cool. Um, 
I think that's the timer that they use and it's got okay. all cool. Now, if I'm wrong, sorry, but I no, will. I'm going to link it below. We'll figure yeah. it out. You guys. Sure. Look below in the description and the right one will be in there. I'll call it classroom <laughs> screen, but you'll see the real link in there if that's not it. Tell me yeah. about it. What is it? Is it well, just like a just, cool timer? It's like just something you can pull up on your browser. It's to, And there's okay. different, you can make different colors and what, yeah. it's just one that two of the teachers said, oh yeah, I love that one. I use that one. Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. All the ideas, all the all ideas. Right. Okay. Well, you guys, Carrie has um, so many ways that she's helping people. This conversation <laughs> is one of them. Another thing that I love that you do, Carrie, is this brain on board blueprint. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe a little bit about what it is and how people can use it to kind of help map out these skills? Yeah. yeah. So that's just, um, it's a free resource on my website um, that is just a way, like, just a handful of, I like to call it a blueprint because it's like, these things are, are most important. A mm -hmm. handful of ways to just almost reframe the way we're thinking about challenges in this area and where to get started. So it's very simple. It's just a, a couple of pages, um, printable if you want to, um, downloadable document for just getting some ideas for how to get started. Awesome. So that's linked below and that's a free thing. So go pick that up. Um, but you've got something else that's happening and it's um, really exciting. And people, you guys, this is a really cool thing. Something that I love about you, Carrie, is there is no shame in this. No, no. So I know I was woefully ignorant about executive functions the first time we talked. I've learned a little bit more and I continue to learn from you. And I love the way that you teach people about this. So tell us about Get the Brain On Board because this is your new course that you are launching and we're so excited about it. And I want people to be able to hop in there. Um, so tell us a little bit about it. What is it? Who is it for? Well, so I, you know, I, I work with a lot of people one-on-one. -on -one. That's what my main gig is. But I started to realize that um, that not everybody can work with me one-on-one, -on -one, first of all, um, just either financially or or just time-wise, they just are so busy. Um, and so I was coming, trying to come up, come up with a way to, to teach this stuff without having to work one-on-one. -on -one. So I decided to create a course. I'm a teacher after all. So I created my own curriculum to, um, to introduce, it's a beginner's course for executive function. So yeah, it's called Get the Brain on Board. It's a beginner's guide to executive function success at school and home. It's designed specifically for parents and teachers. Um, to learn a little bit about your own brain, learn a little bit about your student's brain, and what are some of the strategies, more, many of the strategies um, and tools to try that will support different skills for your students. So I'm super excited about it. Um, it's brand new. Thanks for sharing. Hop over there. Absolutely. So you guys, that'll, that'll be linked below. And if you're a classroom teacher, talk to your administration about this. This is one of those PD things that kind of might fly under the radar, might seem like um, not something that they would support. But this is, as, as Carrie said before, once you see it, you can unsee it. It's there. Um, yeah. So let your admin know about this um, and see if they will cover it um, because this is um, really, really important. It's self-paced too, I should say. It's self-paced. It's, you know, there's seven modules, um, self-paced lifetime access, you know, if you can't, if, I know it's spring. <laughs> so I know what that's like in school. Um, so, you know, and, but the modules are short for squeezing in here and there. So um, there's a lot of things that I designed it specifically for people who I know are very, very busy. I love it. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, you guys check that out. It is a limited time thing. So open that up pronto to check it out. All right. As we wrap up, Carrie, yes. um, I love hearing what people are working on, what they're excited for. And you can take this as personal or professional as you'd like, but what are you excited for in the next six months? What's coming down the pike? Well, I, I'm pretty excited at the moment because I'm going to go for the first time to um, this big conference um, put on by CHAD. I don't know if you know anything about CHAD. Um, it stands for Children and Adults with ADD, so a, a Attention Deficit. Now they call it ADHD, not ADD anymore. But anyway, um, but they do a big conference every year. And this um, November, I know it's a long time away, but this November it's on the West Coast. And last, oh. last year it was not. In the last few years, I haven't been able to go. So I'm planning to go and attend um, and thinking about submitting a proposal as a speaker as well. Yay. So I'm just excited to be around other um, people who are in this world, right? <laughs> um, whether it's professionals or parents and teachers and individuals with, with um, attention challenges. So I'm excited to, to go to exciting. that. That's exciting. 
Yay. Yeah. All right. Well, let us know how that goes. And um, if you end up presenting there, but regardless, we'll keep an eye on what you're up to. You guys, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I am taking copious notes over here. Um, be sure to head to the description. There are a lot of important links in there. So make sure you check that out. Um, and for you guys listening and watching, if nobody's told you yet today, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. It's really important. Happy teaching. Mm -hmm.